Uh, Christian and Jim, how beautiful. Thank you so, so much. Well, this is uh, technically Epiphany Sunday. It's a Sunday when uh, traditionally we hear the text about the wise men and hear a message about the wise men. But I want to go in a little bit different direction this morning because this is also the first Sunday of the year. It's a Sunday in which we here in just a, a few minutes will be uh, consecrating and praying for uh, those who are assuming leadership in the church and we'll be starting off new programs and so many people working uh, to make 2019 a wonderful year for God. And so I want to lift up just very briefly this morning a thought about the membership of the church and the leadership of the church, including the lay leadership and the staff and the pastoral leadership, as being tools in God's hands. I love the, the picture that uh, Sarah found for our bulletin cover this week of the tools. It's, it's almost the perfect picture because the image that comes to my mind uh, is an image that took place several years ago when my son was preparing to get married. As he was preparing to get married, the men's group at the El Reno Church did, I don't know if you call it a pounding or a shower or what you call it, they did something for the men and they invited my son to come and uh, we were invited to give him something either practical or useful or something of sentimental value. And what I gave him on that day was a set of tools that looked just about like this. Now you might say, well why did you give him a bunch of old, old tools? Well, I gave him those tools because they belonged to my grandfather. They were my grandfather's tools uh, that were in a old wooden toolbox uh, that my grandfather actually had made and passed it on to my father. Now, my grandfather was a master carpenter. My father and his brother uh, also, uh, through learning and skill, inherited many of those skills. I inherited zero of that ability, zero. But it skipped a generation and it's re-emerged in my son who does have those abilities. And so what I shared with him and what I gave him on that day was a toolbox with my grandfather's tools. Now, if you were to look at those tools, especially by today's standards, if you were to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or something and look at a set of tools, they look very inferior. They look almost like junk. But I just want to tell you that those tools in the hands of my grandfather built wonderful homes and detailed work and furniture. Those tools in my grandfather's hands accomplished great, great things. And as I read this passage of Paul's epistle to the Corinthians and his instructions and description of the Corinthian church and his self uh, description of himself uh, and their work together, I thought about that image. I thought about those tools that, that what, what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians and what he, he speaks to us today is that it's not great abilities that God uses so much as our willingness to be tools in God's hands. Now, now some of you will continue in positions of leadership today, either teaching in Sunday school classes or helping in the youth group or children's group or uh, working in the choir, either as leaders or as singers, musicians, etc. And yet my experience is that most people whether it's staff people or clergy people, uh, lay people, come to their assignment with a, with a sense of intimidation, with a little bit of sense of who am I to lead this committee? Who am I to be in charge of this ministry? Am I really qualified to be the one uh, to provide service for the church and to try to further the ministry of the church in this particular area? And the short answer is, whether we're talking about the laity of the church, or the staff of the church, or the clergy of the church, is that none of us are really completely adequate. Unless we come to a point within our own mind and heart where we can yield ourselves, where we can give ourselves, where we see ourselves not as the bright, shiny power tools of the modern day, but rather as the simple tools, the, the quiet tools uh, 
that can be used in the hand of a master. I want you to listen. This is really quite a description. I read this passage, but hear these words again. Listen how Paul describes the members of the Corinthian church. If they didn't know he loved them, they might be insulted. But here's what he says. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast in himself. Think of Paul's description of the members of the church. Uh, they were not wise, and, and I guess if you, if you uh, flip that over, you'd have to say they were a little bit foolish. They were not influential. They didn't have a lot of power. Those people didn't uh, have a noble background, but rather he describes them as foolish, weak, lowly, and despised. I've often wondered what the response would be at the conference office when I fill in my annual report and I'm asked to give an assessment of the strengths in the church. And I said, we're really in good shape. We've got a, a bunch of members who are foolish, weak, lowly, and despised. I don't know what the response would be. But that's, but that's how... That's how Paul described them. That's how he wanted to see themselves. They were no big deal. They were just common people. And when you think about that, and you think of that description, one could could rightfully ask the question, well, how could that group of people accomplish anything? How could people who, who have no power, who have no influence, who are foolish and weak and lowly and despised, how can they really get on with anything, any business for the kingdom of God? And yet the fact of the matter is, it was this kind of people who literally changed the world. As John Stott has said, it's not so much great gifts that God uses as great likeliness to Jesus. It's not that we have any inherent power in ourselves or or worthiness in ourselves or great abilities or thinking capacity or strategy in ourselves, but, but when we strive to be like Jesus, then we become tools in God's hands. We become people whom God uses. Billy Graham, the world famous evangelist who traveled the world preaching the gospel, uh, countless numbers, I I would not even begin to guess how many, came to Christ uh, through his messages and through his testimonies and witnesses. One day said, you know, I'm not really sure in the final analysis who has brought more people to Christ, myself or... And he talked about a man he knew, a specific friend of his who was a farmer, who he said was a man of prayer. And as he plowed his field and rode his tractor, as he would go down one row on his tractor, he would think of of certain people or, or certain situations or certain groups of people, and he would pray for them. And then as he turned the corner and started back in the other direction, he would think of somebody else, allow them to come to his mind, and he would pray for them. And thus he spent his day plowing his field and praying for the needs of those in the community, his family, his friends, and those throughout the world. And Billy Graham said, in the final analysis, I don't know who has influenced more people. Uh, myself, who has had a, 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 and enjoyed a measure of fame and, and glamour traveling the world with these crusades, or this simple farmer plowing his field who has been a faithful man of prayer. But the fact of the matter is, uh, whatever was accomplished through them, both, it was done because they trusted not in themselves, but they allowed themselves to be tools in God's hands. Several years ago, when I was still in college, uh, there was a young man who I used to meet on a regular basis. His name was Steve, and I would meet him at coffee houses. He would come to a lot of the different coffee houses of that day, and that was before I had made my profession of faith in Christ. But every time I saw Steve, he would come up to me, he would engage me, he ultimately would witness to me and share with me. 
And I remember the joy in his heart one day when he came up to me at a coffee house. And I was in my first year of college and I said, Steve, uh, guess what? I gave my life to Christ the other day. He was overjoyed. He wasn't the one who led me in the prayer, but he had been influential along that way. And through the years, I've not kept up with him closely, but from time to time we've had the, the pleasure of bumping into one another. And what I found is every time I bumped into him, Steve was still just Steve. He wasn't a man of great influence. He wasn't a man of great power or great wealth or great eloquence. He wasn't an ordained minister. In fact, the last time I talked to him, I ran into him at the Asbury Methodist Church. And I said, Steve, what are you doing here? You remember this church? And he said, well, I am a member of this church. But he said, for the last 10 years, I've been working here with the custodial team. I'm a part of the custodial team. And I said, really? And he said, yes, but that's not my main job. And I said, oh, he said, no, my main job is still sharing my testimony, sharing my faith. I think about Steve and my own journey because there was someone who did not see themselves on, on some kind of journey to greatness, but saw themselves as someone who had found the saving work of Christ and was willing to simply be a tool in God's hands and I have no idea throughout the years myself included how many people he has influenced with his simple testimony of this is how I came to know Christ and this is how you can know Christ and allowing himself to become a tool in God's hands and oh how God has used him throughout the years great great faithfulness well, then Paul goes on in chapter 2, and he describes the leaders of the church. Okay, so we've got a description of the members of the church. They're foolish, weak, lowly, despised, uh, unwise, and influential. That, that's the members of the church. But now Paul describes the leaders of the church, including himself. And he says, So it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. As I proclaim to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ and Him crucified. Listen to this. He says, I came to you in weakness and in great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of God's power. How is Paul describing himself? He says he, he was with them. He was the leader of the church as one who was weak and one who came in fear. He no doubt had heard some of the reputation of the struggles and the problems of the church at Corinth. And when he came there, he came in fear. In fact, he said fear and trembling that, that when he gave his first message, he was overwrought. And, and one of the commentators uh, describes that word saying it's a word that describes one who is literally shaking or trembling with fear. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, overcome by human weakness, feeling uh, the weakness and the shortness of his humanity. He said, I didn't have a great eloquence. He says, in fact, I lack eloquence. There are some who even uh, assume that maybe the thorn in the flesh, although I don't think this is the case, or is some who assume that it may have been some kind of speech impediment. And he said, in all reality, I was non-persuasive. Wow. Is that the picture of the leader of the church? And not really persuasive, not, not an eloquent speaker, one who is weak and fearful and, and intimidated a little bit, and yet, in spite of his weakness, in spite of his shortcomings, Paul did great things. Paul did amazing things. I, I was in the uh, Fidelis class today, and, and Jeff was giving the lesson and talking about some of Paul's ministry to Thessalonica and, and his travels through the then-known world and, and the, the, the number of lives he touched, the number of people he influenced, the number of people who came to Christ, the churches that he encouraged. And, and yet, in so many ways, he, he would say, I'm just an inadequate vessel. I'm a weak human vessel. And I wonder how many of our leaders, when they come into the positions of the church, and they're called to teach a Sunday school class, or they're called to assist with the youth group, or they're called uh, to sing a solo in church, or they're, they're called to be a leader of a committee, and, and they come and, and they think, oh my goodness, I'm going to be chair of the trustees, or I'm going to be chair of the finance committee, or I'm going to be on this, 
this ministry team and I wonder how many come with a certain sense of boy I'm not really sure I'm ready for this I'm not really sure if I'm the person who's equipped to do this and my guess is that so many because I've heard the testimonies as we have done nominations over the course now of 42 years and I've called people and said how would you like to be serve this year on such and such a committee or, or be a worker in the church and and, and oftentimes I get the response, uh, who, me? You know, I'm not sure I'm really the right person for this. And if we're looking at it in terms of our own strength or our own abilities, then we probably are not the right person. But if we realize that our basic calling is just to be a vessel, just to be a tool in God's hand, a tool that God can use to influence and and, and, and to, to reach out. And, and so many of our leaders today, we need, to, we need to be in prayer for them. That is our commitment to them because, quite frankly, each and every one of our leaders, from our staff to our clergy team to our volunteer leaders, etc., they are just humans. They are just doing the best they can. And, and quite frankly, uh, when there are unkind words, when there are complaints, when there's criticisms, usually of someone who's not really involved in trying to do the job that they do, and no wonder there's fear and trembling. No wonder there can be intimidation and a sense of being overwhelmed because uh, their feelings can be hurt as well. And, and they can sense the weakness that comes sometimes through, through the onslaught uh, at times of criticism. I remember a friend of mine First Sunday in his new appointment, and I don't know why there were so many appointment changes this year. This very Sunday is the Sunday for about 30 new appointments across our conference this year. And I remember a very good friend of mine, I called him the afternoon of his first appointment and I said, how did it go? And he said, well, I guess it went okay. And I said, well, did the people seem to like your message? He says, I'm not sure they heard it. I said, what happened? Did the PA fail? He said, no, my knees were knocking so loud. I'm not sure they could really hear, you know, what I was saying. He, and he was confessing. He was intimidated by the situation uh, that was before him and by the challenge of the appointment. But in the midst of, of this situation, of a membership of the church, which is foolish, weak, and, and this lowly and despised, and the leadership of the church, which is weak, intimidated, has a lack of eloquence, and is non-persuasive, Paul says there's one key for all of us. And when we look at the then church uh, and, and the impact on the society and the community they made, how they rocked their world, how they shook their world, how they changed their world, Paul said what is needed is for us to put our trust in Christ, for to put our focus on Christ. Look what he says to the members of the church. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom for God. Christ can be our wisdom. He is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore it is written, let those who boast, boast in the Lord. He says to the members of the church, don't think of your status or your ability. Just put your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Let him be your sufficiency. Let him be your wisdom. Let him be your strength. Paul speaks to the leaders of the church. And he says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came with you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God, but I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul is saying, My goal when I was with you was just to, to center my life in Christ and Him crucified and know that if I can can be a Christ-centered person, if I can be a leader for whom Christ is truly Lord, that I know God will use me and do something through me. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but rather on God. It's when we bring ourselves to the point where we become tools in God's hands that God is able to do a mighty, mighty work for us. I'll close 
with this thought, and I want to again reflect back to my grandfather's tools. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to see four homes that my grandfather built. One was a home when he was a very young man over in West Plains, Missouri. And I went there with a reunion with my uncle Eugene, my dad's brother, a number of number of years ago. And Eugene took me back and he said that was the home that grandpa lived in uh, and then built. And I don't know when that home was built. Very either the last part of the 1800s or first part of the 1900s. And, and Eugene went up and knocked on the door and uh, told the man, he said, my dad built this home uh, years and years ago, and the, and the man invited us in to see it. Uh, that, that home now, over a hundred years old, and yet I remember the man uh, saying to my uncle and to me, this home is still sound as a dollar. It was so well built. It, it was so well built. It, it is a marvelous home. Uh, two homes that I saw, w which I lived in for a while, one was the home that my grandfather, my father, and his brother built side by side over in 5th Street in Tulsa at the close of World War II. Uh, both boys came back. My granddad uh, worked carpentry all day long, and, and my dad uh, going to the University of Tulsa, and at the end of the day they would come and they'd build their, and they built their homes there. And, and on, on occasion when I'm in that part of Tulsa, I still drive by. Uh, to see those homes because one of them was the home of my childhood and then the other is the home over in West Tulsa where I knew that my grandparents lived. That home was built in 1913 according to historical records and the last time Christy and I went by it looked beautiful and I left a card on the door and the man called me. The, the fellow that uh, lives in that home now is now the curator or some title of the Philbrook Art Institute here in Tulsa and I said my grandfather is the one who built that home. He said, and we talked about the history of the home. He said, you know, I find coal over on the north side by a window in the ground still. And I said, yeah, that was a coal chute that went down into the basement. And, and he said, there's still coal down in the ground for that. But he again said, this home is sound as a dollar. And I thought back to all four of those homes, and I don't know how many others uh, around this community, all built with tools that look just like this. All built with tools that a modern carpenter probably wouldn't touch because they're obsolete by today's standards. I know that. The others do things quicker and faster and, and all of that. But it wasn't because the tools were fancy. It wasn't because the tools uh, today were of any great value other than that they were tools that were placed in a master's hands and in his hands homes were built and I invite each of us today whether we're staff or clergy or laity or members of committees or whatever that might be that as we begin this new year as we pray for our leaders as as we set ourselves on a course for 2019, that, that we confess that none of us are really adequate for the job God wants to accomplish. What he wants to accomplish here is far beyond, far beyond the abilities or the wisdom of any of us. But of this I am convinced, if we can place ourselves in God's hands, if we can give ourselves to him, if we can become his tools, I believe he will do wonderful and beautiful and spectacular things through us in 2019. Thank you very much.